podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors with myself, Jackie Jones and the wonderful Bob Cook. And I'm really looking forward to this episode, Bob. I, I don't think I know a lot about this, but we're episode 38 and what we're going to be looking at is dream analysis, imagination and fantasy in the therapy room. What a wonderful podcast we've got coming up. I know. I'm, I'm really excited about this. I have a lot of clients that have asked me, does my dream mean anything? I keep having this dream. Is it significant? And apart from having a book somewhere called Dream Dictionary, I have no idea. <laughs> so I'm laughing because I can tell you how to answer that question. <laughs> but tell me then. <laughs> Just tell them yes. Yes. <laughs> yes right. I'll answer yes, because dreams... Look, dreams have been going on for centuries. Yes. It's nothing new. I mean, Freud wrote an article, Interpretation of Dreams, I think in 1898, published in a book by him in 1900. But we can go back centuries before that, all the way back to Socrates, um, and, and we can trace dreams and how people looked at dreams through different civilizations and different times, um, you know, we can go right back to, as I said, to Socrates, and we can look at, they believed in um, dreams in terms of often um, divine intervention, as we work through, some cultures believed in dreams in supernatural ways, uh, we go right up. But let's start at Freud, because probably that's where we are in the European culture. Now, he really, in his, that book, or that article, Interpretation of Dreams, believed the dreams were really uh, about uh, fulfillment of wishes. In other words, uh, our own fulfillment of our inner desires. Okay. Dreams, you know, dreams were in the area of the unconscious. And he, you know, for he termed the name for dreams or a wonderful description, they are the, the royal road to your unconscious. Young, when he was talking, who was also a disciple in terms of, uh, of Freud's in terms of psychoanalysis and dreams, talked about this as the uh, royal road to uh, the soul. Either way, the dreams sit in the world of the unconscious of the individual. So when your client says to you, I have dreams, whether they be nightmares, daydreams, repetitive dreams or in fact even if they say well I don't remember my dreams but I know you know I've been told that everybody dreams for example yeah you can say yeah this is all about the your unconscious um for he said the fulfillment of inner inner desires that haven't been uh realized or conflicts um trauma etc in fact Freud just before he died talked about dreams also being about expression of trauma that hasn't been released or worked through so either way dreams are about the internal world of the individual either way we look at it so with psychotherapic clients particularly we, we're always um, looking for how uh, trauma dreams I you know ideas and myths whichever way you look at it are actually repressed and often uh, in the world of the unconscious and get acted out unconsciously in the external world. So if we can help our clients look at what's happening in the unconscious world that's not not been actually externalized, dreams are a great tool for uh, this, to analyze them, to interpret them, to look at what might have been desired but actually is repressed, for example. Yeah, I find it fascinating because I I fall into the category. I don't remember my dreams the majority of the time. On the very rare occasion where I do remember it, they're that obscure. I find it hard to relate it to anything. Well, you know, dream interpretation is that up for interpretation? 
Yeah, I mean, when you say you don't remember anything, um, I think the most successful dreams are often when people are scared, they frighten themselves, often in the world of nightmares. And then, of course, you've got daydreams. Yes. Not just, uh, you know, you're talking about dreams and the unconscious. I mean, daydreams, we all daydream, don't we? Yeah. And yeah, they're, yeah. they're in the world of um, conscious and unconscious. But if a client comes to me for it, I can't think of anybody that's ever said anything like this, so I'm not referring to a particular client. But if a client says, I was on a train and I went in this carriage and there was a wolf sitting there and a woman in a black cloak with a sheep, what does that mean? What do I say to that? Am I supposed to be able to interpret that dream? Well, I, I think whether it's Freud, whether it's Jung, whether it's some of the later psychotherapists, they have to always look at it, but they all talk about the interpretation will be in the unconscious world of the clients. Now, in the way you've just talked about, let's take that example, it would be probably just taking off the top of your head. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm thinking of some TA therapists called the Gouldings uh, in analysing dreams. I got taught, um, not by them personally, but um, by some people who have been on their workshops about dreams. They would see the dream or every aspect of the dream as part of the self. Okay. So the wolf would be part of the self. The tunnel would be part of the self. The train would be part of the self. The television, if that dream that was in your dream would be part of the self. So everything you dreamt, including the inanimate objects, would be part of the self. That's fascinating, Bob. Right, so if you were for coming from their perspective, which really sits in the Gestalt world more than the TA world, that's Fitz Pearls, etc. cetera, uh, uh, that view is about, as I've just said it, that everything you dream is part of yourself. Different conflicts, different traumatic parts, different parts of yourself which haven't have expression of desire, um, et cetera, et cetera. So a Gestalt psychotherapist or the TA therapist, Gestalt if you want to, would get the client or ask the client to um, talk to the different parts of themselves that have been represented in the dream. Okay. So it'd be, do, it'd be doing, it'd be, it'd be a bit like doing role play work. So for example, you'd say, okay, we need part of yourself to play the train, part of yourself to play the wolf, part of yourself to play the man that came in the carriage of the surprise you, the part of yourself uh, that it was thinking other things I would have to flesh out the dream even yeah. more yeah so then we'd get all those parts of the dream and as I said you'd role play each part of them and talk to each part of them and just see what comes up yeah so let's make up a dream make I haven't, got, I haven't remembered any trauma dreams recently to just flash out but I mean you know um I could think of one where <sighs> I don't know, two or three months ago where I was sitting in the front room and um, my Steph came in, who's my wife, and then uh, my uh, sister from childhood came in the room and we were watching television. Then my father came in and then my mother and father started shouting at each other and the television grew louder, everything got more blacker, and then I woke up. So what you would do, you play you play your mother you play the father you play the television someone plays the room someone plays your sister xxx and then you ask them to talk to each other now the way i used to do that was i had cushions to represent different parts of the self yeah and the mother would talk to the father the television would then report back what they're thinking and you'd have the um dialogues between the different parts of the self and from that from that you would perhaps see where it goes and perhaps what the hope would be that you would uncover the, uncover the conflicts 
between the different parts of the South, or at least move to perhaps some interpretation of what was happening between the conflicts of different parts of the South. That's fascinating. So what if somebody was replaying a, a past trauma in a dream? Is that the same thing? Would you, is, is, is that yeah. separate parts of the self, even if it's replaying a past yeah. event? Yeah, in fact, uh, yes, definitely in the way I'm just talking about. Okay. And interestingly enough, I was just reading an article the other day, right up to date, 2021, and it was talking about CBT and the use of CBT. But then it was talking about, and I can't remember the acronyms anyway, of uh, the th therapy with clients who have been traumatized by analyzing their dreams with the objective to help the person uh, externalize the trauma that was coming out in their dreams. And the way they did that was to get the person to go over the dream, go over the dream, go over the dream, go over the dream, slow down the dream, talk about the content of the dream, and help flesh out the trauma that is beneath the uh, memories of the dream, memories in the dream. And um, I wish I'd read the end of the article, but it was all about, and I wish I got the acronym to it, it this way of uh, repeating the specificity of the dream or the content of the dream to get to the layers of the trauma. So, for example, nightmares are all about trauma. Yeah, yeah. Or the expression of trauma in some way. We all know about we can wake ourselves up often because we're scared of what we're actually feeling in the dream. And that usually is an attempt to express trauma, for example. All this is in the world of the unconscious, though. And as I said, Freud, just before he died, talked about had moved from the idea of dreams simply being about the performance of desires that hadn't been realised to the expression of trauma, the attempt to express trauma. Yeah. And in, in where we are in 2021, I was interested in the article that we as therapists would help the client go through the content of the dream many, many, many times with the attempt to get to the trauma, which is underneath the content of the dream. So are you saying then that they don't know what the trauma is? Often what comes out in dreams is symbolism. Okay. Symbols. Okay. Just like you brought in off the top of your head a wolf. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to do therapy online with you, but if we started to look what a wolf meant for you and what would be the symbol of that, and perhaps to even act like a wolf, or we could think of many different ways imaginatively to, to, uh, to play out what a wolf may or may not meant for you, underneath that, or we could even play out the part of you that wasn't the wolf, would probably get to what might be some trauma somewhere and what that all means in a symbolic way okay what if it's specifically replaying an actual event well i think that's what happens in dreams we can have high stimulus i mean i don't watch really horrific gory films me neither at nine or ten o'clock just before i go to bed i don't watch them full stop i don't like being yeah, scared <laughs> but i think quite often the high stimulus of the the what's going on in the environment or the television or the radio just before yeah. we go to bed can often stimulate uh, terror in us or yeah. scare in us or trigger uh, something in our history which hasn't been resolved which then comes out in a dream yeah but often you will talk about people trying to resolve things from something they've just watched and it comes out in the dream. Yeah, because, you know, on the very rare occasion where I have had a dream or a nightmare and I've woken up part way through it, there's a physiological 
thing going on that I feel scared if I've had a scary dream and I wake up, you know, kind of halfway through it. Mm, that's right. Yeah. I mean, when I remember going to a workshop by a Freudian who taught me how to analyse dreams from his perspective. And what he did with his clients who, say, wanted to analyse a dream, he'd, he'd say, OK, so what was happening in your dream? And so they go through the dream. And then they said, what happened? How did it end? And the person says, well, I just woke up or I woke up scared or, or whatever. And then the analyst says, OK, I'd like you to, through imagination, just imagine what would happen if the dream went on another three minutes. The client then imagines what might have been going on when the dream stopped. Yeah. And then, then to talk about, or oh, that would be an encouragement about analysing the dream from that perspective, you know, because the idea is that you wake yourself up unconsciously at the time when perhaps the trauma might have been resolved or the conflicts might have been um, dealt with, but you wake yourself up because of the unresolved conflict. So if you go on three or four minutes, you might get to what was underneath the conflicts before you stopped. Yeah. And I would imagine that would be less scary for the client mm. if they're conscious and, you know, carrying the dream on, if that makes sense. Because I think that's one of the things with nightmares is they just happen. It's not like we have any control over them on a conscious level. That's right. But if you saw the nightmares as trauma. Yeah. So it's history rather than what I've just said, you might, might scare yourself. You watch Silent Witness and somebody's been opening up bodies or whatever it is. So you go to bed and then you might scare yourself and you, you uh, that's an attempt to resolve what you've just been stimulated by. I'm not talking about that. Yeah. If it's been triggered off in your history at a traumatic level, then I think, and this is what I was talking about earlier on, that if you get your client to, to repeat or remember what they remembered many, many times, you may get to not only interpretations, but what is underneath the memory so you can get to the trauma. Yeah. Yeah. When you think about it, Bob, our minds or bodies or, you know, the holistic thing that is a human being, we're really good at doing all this stuff, aren't we? If there's some unresolved trauma and a dream is a way of bringing it to our attention. That's right. It's a, it's a pretty clever technique to be using. Yeah, I think, I mean, Jung talked about dreams being a, being a way of rebalancing or addressing the psyche. Yeah. And he also talked about dreams being a way of dealing with what he called the collective unconscious. So, you know, I think the brain is particularly sophisticated, particularly clever, if you want to use those words. And it's a way, and dreams are a way of dealing with unresolved conflicts, I think, unfulfilled wishes, traumas that haven't been dealt with. And as Jung says, rebalancing and dealing with the internal and external worlds, which have got out of, out of sync. Yeah. And Gestalt therapy, and I very much like the idea of taking this further in the unconscious, that the, 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 our different parts of ourselves, which are a conflict, get played out in our dreams in an attempt to resolve the conflict. Yeah. So if we can get the different parts of ourselves to be played out externally through role play, and the therapist can see those dialogues, they can help bring some resolution to the conflicted parts which which the dreams had been attempted to do yeah it's fascinating but often we wake ourselves up before we go that extra step yeah so the therapist can help us do that and help us sort out those unconscious processes so that our external world is more peaceful 
Yeah. And of course, on, on, on another level, let's just talk about the dreams we all have, our daydreams often. Desires for how we're going to be in the future. Uh, uh, for example, all of you, let's ask yourself here, you could ask myself, we could ask any of the therapist listeners, what was the unconscious motivation for us to be psychotherapists? What made us go into the world of psychotherapy? What made us specialize with particular clients? So for example, why, you know, I was a teacher and a lecturer in politics before I trained in psychotherapy. Why did I, what was the motivation unconsciously for, to, for me, not only to stay in the world of psychotherapy, but to stay in the world of psychotherapy for 38 years, helping people with their internal conflicts, their, their misery, their worries, their depressions, their hopes, their desires. And also what was the motivation unconsciously for me to specialize uh, with people who would, who were dissociated, fragmented, cut off, disowned. Um, what, what, what was the motivation for me to be doing this for all these years? And it's the same for every therapist, same for you. Why, what was the motivation? And I think every therapist probably dreams. And uh, I mean, I certainly did. Uh, certainly did when I talked about uh, my career. And uh, I, if I really start to look at those dreams and those myths and those thoughts, I can see probably that I, one of my unconscious motivations was I wanted to help people. I mm -hmm. wanted people to find themselves in the ways that I didn't find myself and to look for the lost parts of themselves because my history was very much in that whole area about being lost and someone um, being lost and never found. And so I, if you look at my career, I'm playing out my unconscious world in a way which is not only cathartic to me, but provides me internally and externally with a different outcome. So I think those are all dreams. They're the stories we tell ourselves. Those yeah. are the myths that we tell us ourselves. We might even use those myths um, in the service of our clients. Yeah. Hey, the, the daydreaming and, and, you know, things like that, I can kind of understand how that works because yeah it's it's one of the big questions that i ask clients a lot of the time what's your why why now why you know and <clears throat> i suppose we all have our own story that that gets us to where we are yeah and so do clients so every yeah. i couldn't tell you how many clients i've seen over 38 years but i can tell you that for every client i've sat down with i attempt to think about and dream about and visualize about what their story is and help them to come to their own understanding of their own story yeah and how it's not only helped but also hindered them hindered them in uh, getting to where they wanted to do today so i i have spent my life thinking about other people's stories dreaming about other people's stories thinking about the myths of their own stories, helping them get to their unique stories, often by myths that, you know, what do we mean by myths? Is that we, everybody has their own story, their own unique story, their own myths about what they, how they came into the world, uh, what it all means for themselves. Yeah. I've got my own myth, if you like, about how I move from being where I was to where I am today and the in-between bit. Yeah. It is Ooh. it is fascinating. And yeah, I was thinking like mm. manifestation and things like that. You, you, do you know what I mean? Using our imagination to the good of us. I, I can remember, I think it's an NLP technique that I used with my youngest son when he was a lot younger. He was having recurring nightmares. 
So I I got him to really focus in on the characters in the dream and yeah. to to change the way that it looked. You know, was he in the dream or was he observing it? Where was he looking at it? What colours were in there? And to get him to imagine like a television screen where he was turning up the brightness and adjusting <laughs> it and yeah. making it less scary. Yeah. So that kind of thing fascinates me on how our brain can process all of that stuff. Well, I mean, the use of fantasy and create particularly, isn't that what therapists do every day of their lives with clients? I suppose when you put it that way, yeah. I think for me, the, the whole thing about dream interpretation, it, it, I don't know, it doesn't sit well with me because I can only interpret it through my own understanding yeah. Does so that we, make sense? So I'd, I'd always be very dubious about whether I've got the right meaning yeah. from what I'm being told. Yes, and there's two ways of looking at this. If we, if you use the Gestalt way of analysing dreams and get them to role play different parts of themselves and the different conflicts or traumas or whichever way you want to call this, then you aren't making any interpretations. You're really following the dialogue and helping them look at the different conflicts of yourself, which you'll do every day of your life in couples therapy. Yes, yeah, yeah. For example, so it's no different. You're dealing with the internal cut-off parts of the self, which come out in dreams. And you just help the person get in role play, through role play, and what I'm talking about, um, the dialogues, the traumas that have been happening in the past. So it's no different. But if you go back to Freudian interpretations, then, um, and if you go to you know, dream dictionaries when they talk about different terms, then it's a bit different because you, you're doing what psychoanalysts did 100 years ago, which was foist interpretations onto their clients. Now, relational psychotherapy is a million miles away from that. Good, because I struggle with yeah. all this stuff. Yeah. So I'm not talking about that. Good. Yeah, I'm talking about that's why I like Gestalt psychotherapy in the way I was just talking about. Well, yes. relational dream analysis is when you analyze the dreams together. Yes, yeah, through mutual dialogue. Yes, so that's different again. Yeah, it's just that whole interpreting you know, they say that if your teeth fall out, it means something in your dreams, and if you see yeah. a white rabbit and all it, I, I don't understand so that. That comes from psychoanalysis. 100 years ago where the analyst was the expert yeah that that doesn't <laughs> fit well with me the other stuff you know exploring the dream and yeah. playing the different yeah. parts and because i suppose the client has given you the information if they're talking about the dream and what they can remember then it is the reality of that dream as opposed to me putting my yeah, yeah well you, you were trained in relational psychotherapy from a ta framework so where, where, where it's a very completely different orientation of psychoanalysis. I mean, they're two different worlds. So I'm not surprised that you are thinking of dream analysis in terms of a humanistic relational perspective, rather than a one up, one down expert perspective. When they're yeah. two different I do find it interesting, which is why I have that book, because clients have specifically asked me, what does it mean if I've got this in a dream? Yeah, and I will cool. say, I have a book, I can have a look, but I don't understand it. <laughs> oh, that's, I've got a book about the stars, Libran, uh, Scorpio, Sagittarius. So we can look, yeah. at it, but I'm not talking about that. That's interesting. That's it. Psychoanalysis is a different one. That's very different. I'm talking, I prefer the relational humanistic. Me too. Yes. Yeah. Analyzing dreams, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I'd rather have dream dialogue than the dream analysis, but we just. And it is an exploration of, of the dream mm. in the conscious way in the therapy room. It is. But if I just move back to fantasies for a moment. <clears throat> which I, when I said we all think of fantasies every day of our lives, it depends on how you see the outcome of psychotherapy. If you think psychotherapy is about helping the person develop their own story, look at the story of how it is today and how it affects them and help them rewrite a different script or a different story so they can get a different outcome today, 
then what you're then you're not far away from fantasy therapy, are you? Because you're helping them develop their stories, their scripts through fantasy. Because it has to be fantasy. What else can it be? Yeah. Because it's not a reality yet. It's their own unique story. Yeah. And what you're you're attempting to do is look at how that script, their own story of how they see that world, has hasn't helped them today. So to help them develop a new script or a new way of being so they have a more healthier outcome today, one of the best tools is through helping them develop what fantasies, positive fantasies, that, that they can desire or even just think about barely for once in their lives, which might be the creation of a new script. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And the true potential and how yeah. it can be moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Often through by often through visualizations, which yeah. is fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. Often through creative stories, which is often fantasy. Yeah. And again, you know, role playing can play quite a big part in that. Well, the therapy we could go on and on. Yeah. The utilization yeah. of imagining a fantasy positive can often be the development of a a new exciting script which gives them a potential the clients may never have dreamed of well maybe i need to start doing this in the therapy room bob <laughs> i think you probably do it every day I, I, yeah i probably do with, with the way that you've explored it and explained it now yeah yeah every day because because without without helping the person explore their fantasies their potentials their desires their excitements their curiosity their dreams you're you're you, you, you're not going nowhere aren't you because you have to explore all those to enable the person to actually capture the possibility of a new world for them yeah so i think i would be astonished if you didn't do that every day of your life yeah however you wanted to to term that in your own way of looking at that but i think you, yeah without doing that a person will get stuck in their own script because they won't have the imagination fantasies potential to actually look at a new way of being now dream analysis by helping them look at their un unconscious in a relational way yeah and the different parts of themselves which get played out externally you've got a fantastic well, I think the unconscious is a fantastic, is a fantastic, wonderful uh, metaphor, if you want to even look at that, I don't know about reality, uh, which holds a huge uh, amount of thoughts, memories and repressed traumas. And if we can get hold of looking at that through dreams or fantasies, that's wonderful. Mm. Because then they can change their external reality. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what it's all about, isn't it, really? Uh, yeah, but and therapists need to help the person do that. Yeah. Because they can't do it themselves because they're stuck in it. Yeah. You talk to somebody who's just stuck in a re repetitive recurring nightmare. Scared yeah. every night. Have repetitive dreams. Yeah, it is. It, it it's been caught in that loop, and it it's not it's not nice. Yeah, no, so it needs somebody from the outside, from the outside. It's like a bio loop, isn't it? From yeah. the outside, to actually help the person uh, understand whether by myth, myth, metaphor, not so much interpretation, because I'm with you on that. Uh, to um, it's like going through the sort of layers of an onion to get to what the trauma and the conflict's about and how they can change that in their external world. Yeah. It's fascinating. I, think dreams, fantasy, I think dreams, fantasy, imagination, they're all the tools of the therapist. And if they don't use them, whoa, the clients, it, it, it takes, therapy takes a lot, lot longer lot lot younger you know longer i mean yeah without yeah. music therapy we haven't even touched music therapy if you put some evocative music you so you be your clients come in the room and it's playing i don't know i, I, I just a, an evocative 
um, streets of London or whether it be the latest, whatever music really, that, that in itself would trigger off fantasies, mm. trigger off many different parts of the unconscious. And without the therapist using these, these tools, I think they're, they're very limited you know, in the process. Yeah. Yeah. It, have you ever used music in a therapy room, Bob? Yeah. Now, I, I, you know, well, I perhaps you don't, but you do. I think you do. But as a therapist, my main aim is always to go to the unconscious, which is called the younger self or the child ego state in transaction analysis. Now, to get there, to help the person move away from their adult self to their younger self or their unconscious self, which whatever language you want to use you, you need to help them do that and the best ways to do that in my opinion are is through creativity and imagination and therefore i like art therapy music therapy um play therapy role therapy um any of those creative parts which help the person go to a different part of their psyche, hopefully their younger part, their unconscious part, where the trauma and the conflict lies. Because it doesn't lie in the adult ego state. No, no. It doesn't really lie in the parent ego state. They might have psychotic disturbed parents which have imposed things onto the parent. But you need to get to the child, you need to get the unconscious part, the younger part of the self, and think creative methods like we're talking about her here, which help us get to the unconscious or the younger part is something which I have been using these techniques and tools and ways for the last 38 years. All of them. All of them. Art therapy particularly. Any of them which will get the person to their younger parts of the self where the trauma is. The trauma is never in the adult. No, no. No. Otherwise, you're just pastiming. Yes. Not really in the parent. Well, it's, the trauma might be in the disturbed parent, but you need to get to the child or the younger part of the self first to, to where the trauma is before you get to the parent. But you certainly don't need to, you're certainly not going to stay in the adult. So you have to use, I believe, fantasy, imagination, creative expression to get to the child which is often so locked up in repression that these ways that we're talking about now are the keys to unlock the spirit yeah i i do i do like it and i do get what you're saying you know i, I suppose one of the main creative things that i use in the therapy room i would love to do art therapy by the way i i i've not done that but i would love to do that is metaphors and stories and visualization you know ways yeah. of putting their story into yeah. something yeah. they can visualize Wonderful. Like jars on a supermarket shelf with different memories in or you that sort of yeah story the best way to do yeah. the best way to do contracting is through art therapy get them to draw what they want to change then get them to draw how they're going to stop themselves making their change because they haven't made the change already, they want to be in therapy. And then get them to draw what they need to do to uh, get the desire, what they want, what, what's going to stop them getting what they want, and thirdly, what they need to do. But do it all through drawings. See, I think for, for, for a lot of clients, that would be a, a challenge because straight away as adults we're really judgmental and critical of you know and having that blank piece of paper and having to do yeah. something on it yeah. yeah so wouldn't it be wonderful then it for would be wonderful. to experience a therapist who wasn't critical wasn't yeah. judgmental all the things you're talking about yeah gave them the permission to just express themselves in any way they wanted yeah and if we find it really hard then they can write it yeah and it is it's a safe space in the therapy room to be creative to to do whatever it is that you want so but 
but my instant reaction when you were talking about art therapy then was yeah and straight away the majority of them would say I can't draw I can't I can't do that I'm no yeah, good at I that. I think if they experience yeah. a different type of parent a different type of permissions and they've got a good relationship with the therapist they may attempt to just express themselves with the knowledge they it's not about perfect drawing or perfect mm. this that the other they can just put something down on the page and that's art therapy yeah I but could spend all day colouring in a therapy session Bob I, that would be my yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would love that <laughs> yeah. but the most important thing would be then to go on to the saboteur and what stops them achieving that goal again by drawing that process yeah. now it's not about pictures it's about expression of the unconscious yes i know exactly what you're saying because we have a sort of parent oriented society about perfect pictures and everything else but my experience is that if they get the if people get the chance to have a therapist that is giving them permission to just express whatever comes up yeah they will go with that yeah and that is the wonderful part of the child or being a child is that there's no judgment there they're, they're not critical they just do it so to keep to reconnect with that part of yourself in a therapy room through art therapy using imagination and creativity would be amazing yeah and if you want to go a step further but this might be a bit of a stretch for what for you given what you've just said is <laughs> ask them to draw um, with a non-dominant hand yeah now, so i'm right-handed so that would mean encourage me to draw with my left hand and why that it would be so evocative is that it would take you back to the early times in your life when you were struggling to to draw for the first time in any sense of expression and that's of course where you want your clients to go to yeah see I, again I, I love that Bob I, I know somebody that does do art therapy and that's one of the things that they do is they draw with their non-dominant hand they are an artist but in the therapy with clients they use their non-dominant hands so that there isn't any i don't know comparisons yeah. You know so I'll, yeah ask them to draw their fantasies i mean i was talking about contracts a moment ago but there's so many different directions to go and it's the same with all these mediums and we're talking about here they are to enable the the, the, the client to visit their unconscious or their younger self and then to help the therapist look at the conflicts the trauma the wishes that haven't been fulfilled etc etc bob this episode i've loved this episode we need to do more conversations like this um <laughs> i don't even know what we're doing in the next episode um no well i've got one go on and you said we haven't done it and asked me ask ask us could we do it and i i said off oh, uh, have we done it to you and you said we haven't but that's erotic transference. Right. Now, if we haven't done it, I'll quite happily talk about that. And that we, will be episode 39 then, erotic yeah. transference. And the other one, we can just pick something from the, uh, the list. Self-harm. Yeah. Have we done self-harm? I think we've covered self-harm. So we can pick one other from the list. Yeah. We can start off with erotic transference. So the next episode will be around erotic transference. Looking yeah, in, the forward to it. in the therapeutic room, because we all have erotic transference in the, in the normal world anyway. So this will be specifically about erotic transference in the therapeutic world and how to use it. Yeah, in service of positivity for the client. Interesting. We're getting some juicy, some juicy content in these episodes. That's an, because you know, there's not talk, not there's not enough talked about when we're talking about sex in the therapeutic room, and of course, most of the most of the sexual process we're talking about, we can talk about in the process of erotic transference, and of course, erotic transference goes both ways. In other words, the therapist that fancies or transfers their eroticism onto the client just as much as the other way around. Interesting stuff, Bob. 
It's like you say, we, we do, there's a lot of things that we don't talk about that, that you know, th this is behind closed doors of the therapy room. So there's, there's, there's no taboo topics. Yeah, yeah, because look, you got, yes, we, I could go on about the subject. Uh, I, I talk, talk about it a lot. I think I've written an article on this particular subject area. And then we'll just pick one other from the huge list we've got. The huge list that you sent me. <laughs> well, I think we've gone through about 20 of the list you sent us. Yeah. Uh, well, we're, we're up to we're, this next one, Erotic Transference, will be episode 39, so we're, we're plodding through them. But, yeah, there, there was about 100 on that list, Bob, that you sent me. We haven't been anywhere. <laughs> no. So Erotic Transference, then one other, and then yeah. we'll pick another two from the list as we go along. I didn't know it was number three. 30 whatever it is 38 or 39 um but uh, uh i look forward to continuing them anyway me too thank you so much i really enjoyed this episode bob oh take care see you at the next one see you on the next one bye 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 you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review We'll be back next week with another episode.